Welcome to Walking Through the Word. I am Josiah Espinoza. Today we'll be reading John chapter 13, verse 1 through 20. So if you have your Bibles, open them with me as we walk through the Word together. Verse 1 says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. So Jesus knows that his time has finally come. The Greeks are now seeking him, and he knows that when he dies on the cross, he's going to die for both Jewish people and Gentile people. And so we have here Jesus loving his own who were in the world. He loved them to the end. He loved his own to the end. And this can be a reference to the Jewish people, just as it is in John chapter 1, verse 11, when it says that Jesus came into his own people, and his own people rejected him. But it can also be in reference to his elect people. So yes, Jesus came to the Jewish people, and he did love them. He was patient with them, and he was gentle with them. And he showed them what it meant to be lowly, and to have humility and humbleness. So he loved them even to the end of his life. But also, he loves his own people, his elect people. The people that he lays his life down for. The sheep that he knows by name. Those are his own as well. And those individuals he loves to the end. Those people he will love even after the end is done. Verse 2 says, During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. I find it fascinating that the devil put it into Judas Iscariot's heart to betray Jesus. You might ask yourself, doesn't the devil know that if Jesus goes to the cross, that's the end of the devil? He will be destroyed. He will have no power. And the answer is yes, he knows this. But we have to also realize that in the other Gospels, he tries everything to try to stop Jesus from getting to that cross. He tempts him in the wilderness after Jesus' baptism to try to give him the world, to make people see him as the Messiah so that he doesn't have to go to the cross. And then when Peter rebukes Jesus and says, May it never be, I'll never let you die. Jesus says, Get thee behind me, Satan. He says, Satan, get out of my way. I'm getting to that cross, and you cannot stop me. So why does the devil, at the very end, why does he put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot to betray Jesus, to solidify that death on the cross? And I think it's because the devil hates Jesus so much that he wants to make it as painful as humanly possible. He wants to use one of Jesus' closest friends, his own disciple, to betray him. He wants it to hurt. He wants Jesus to experience the most pain possible. And Jesus knows this. Because in verse 3 it says, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands. So everything that was going to partake, everything that was just going to happen in within the next few hours, Jesus knows Judas, his great friend, is going to betray him. His, all of his disciples are going to flee from him and abandon him. He knows also that he's going to be uh, tortured and imprisoned and falsely accused, and he's going to be hung on a cross. He knows these things are going to take place, and he can stop it. He knows he has the power and the ability to call a whole army of angels to come and rescue him. And yet, look at how he responds. He responds by rising from the supper table. Verse 4, he laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. And what an incredible 
testimony of the humility and humbleness of Jesus. To know that he will undergo some of the worst pain any human being could ever go through. And yet, he has the power to stop it. But no one takes his life from him. He, lay it, he lays it down willfully. He lays it down because he loves his own. And he knows he was getting ready to depart to be glorified with the Father. And yet, instead of gloating, instead of rebuking them, instead of saying, I already know you will betray me, how dare you guys? He wraps himself in a loincloth and a towel and washes his disciples' feet just like a slave would. In verse 7, Jesus answered him, Why, what, I, what I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. And Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. <laughs> and I think that's such a... I don't think we should judge Peter for his answer. The natural human tendency is to serve the master. It's for the servant to serve the master. The natural t human tendency is to do things for the, for the master, for the one who is leading you and teaching you. It is not a normal thing for a leader a king, a god, to humble himself and to wash people's feet. Nor is it normal for a god to come down and be crucified, and yet he did it so that he would wash us. And Peter's, Peter's not telling him, no, don't wash my feet. I don't want you to touch my feet. He's saying, no, no, please. I don't want you to wash my feet. Because I'm just a human. You are my teacher. You're my master. You're my king. You're my God. You're my Lord. But listen to the answer of Jesus. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. So Jesus' answer to Peter is lowly. It's beautiful. Listen, I need to wash you, Peter. I need to. Or else we can't ever have communion with one another. You can never become one with me. So Simon Peter says, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. So give me a bath, God. Wash all of me. Verse 10 said, Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet. But he is completely clean and you are clean but not every one of you. So Jesus begins to separate the reality that Peter, although his feet may be clean, or although his feet may be dirty, the rest of him is completely clean. The inside of him is clean. The outside of him is clean, except for his feet. And yet, when speaking about Judas... Verse 11, for he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean. And yet we find Jesus washing the feet of even the betrayer. Knowing. Knowing that Judas was filthy all the way through and through. Verse 12, when he had washed their feet, and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. So again, we find Jesus giving us an example of how we are to treat one another in the body of Christ. 
If we are washed by the blood of the Lamb, then we are to wash one another's feet. We are to serve one another. Husbands, wash your feet's wife, your wife's feet. Wash your children's feet. Serve them. Humble yourself. Wives, wash your husband's feet. Wash your children's feet. And children, wash your parents' feet and wash your brothers' and sisters' feet. Friends and family, wash each other's feet. Serve one another. You're not greater than Jesus. And if Jesus humbled himself and washed his own disciples' feet, then we should do that for one another. To humble ourselves, to serve one another, to give everything that we are to one another. Because that is what the love of Christ is in us. Verse 18. I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen. But the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I am telling you this now before it takes place. That when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me. And whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. So Jesus prophesies of the betrayal of Judas. He puts a reference of scripture. He who ate my bread has lifted. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. Speaking of Judas, who was eating the Last Supper, the Passover meal with him. But he chose him. He chose not only the twelve, but also Judas, who was going to betray him. He knows whom he has chosen. He knows that by choosing Judas to follow him as one of his disciples, he knows he would have to undergo the pain of his own disciple betraying him. He knows. And he knows you. And he knows the sins. And he knows the betrayal. And he knows the hatred. But he's telling you. He's telling you. He knows you. And if you are willing to receive this message, then you are willing to receive him. And if you receive him, you're receiving the one who sent him, that is the Father. So I pray that you are receiving this message. I pray that you are repenting of your sins. I pray that you would turn from your wicked ways. Believe in the only Son of God. Put your hope, faith, trust in him as Lord of the universe. May the Lord richly bless you and keep you always in his loving embrace. Until next time on Walking Through the Word.